Shake, Rattle, and Troll, a show for the serious fishermen, as well as the novice looking for tips from the pros. Shake, Rattle, and Troll is brought to you by Bill Luke Dodge Chrysler Jeep. Now, here's your host, saltwater fisherman and tournament pro, Don McDowell. Hey, I'm Don McDowell. Welcome to Shake, Rattle, and Troll this Sunday. Appreciate you listening. Hope there's not a weed eater involved in your day. Joining us, as always, J.K. <laughs> Good morning, Bass Daddy. Known as Special K. And uh, we have uh, another special guest, Tom Inman. Good former morning. Former USMC guy. If you want it positively destroyed overnight, I'll give you his phone number. From Army Bass Anglers, we're going to go down the road. Uh, Sergeant Andy Gettle is going to be joining us after he gets through with his PT test. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> Does that involve running? Well, it's either physical training or psychological mm. something. We don't we don't want him after psychological t- testing, do we? He'd be all screwed. They're all certified. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, about 8.15, we're going to be talking to uh, our new fisheries branch chief, Chris Cantrell. Chris has some late breaking news on some of the good things that are happening over at... Um, Roosevelt Lake. We've been working very hard on uh, trying to find a magic bullet to fix the gizzard shad, the bass, uh, stunted bass growth, the lack of crappies. I think we have not found a silver bullet, but we have a box of them. Yeah, we need so, a whole box of them. Uh, we've introduced him in, to the term uh, shoot, move, and adjust fire. Anything that will remove gizzard shad from Roosevelt is a good thing. That's going to be a long process. I still, but, you know, we I, still need an awesome recipe that they can serve in good recipes. I have 1,801. You know? I know, but I want a good one. Well, there is one similar to, <clears throat> do you like creamed herring? I do. Creamed gizzard shad. Yum. No. <laughs> Wait a minute, you've never tasted it. How do you know? <laughs> Come on, Tom. Come on. Hey, did you see that uh, smallmouth caught yesterday up there? Uh, no, I was digitally... Uh, Immersed in almost a six pounder. No way. Ty it rose though. Ty Al caught it. Oh, wow. Five point eight five pounds, I believe. Something like if that. If Ty caught it, did he tell you how much it weighed? No, they got a picture of it. It was at the uh, okay Total Bass Addicts tournament. Yeah. Nice. What did he catch it on? Ah, uh, who knows? <laughs> Probably swim bait. <laughs> would Would anybody tell the truth anyhow? Right. No. Right. Thank no. you. Why bother? <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Exactly. So on on I know how you guys with operate a bass now. Tournament. Yeah. I've Pretty. watched you guys enough now. I know. <laughs> hey, hey what did you shoot you off with? <laughs> a bow. Where'd you, <laughs> you find those antlers in the woods? <laughs> oh, there it is up on. He caught the, it on a hook. Wow. Yeah. That is a bruiser. <clears throat> Smalley. Wow, that's a largey. Yikes. Good, good job, Ty. All righty, uh, we've got some other things going on. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of uh, Bill Luke Bass Days. Uh, Army Bass Langlers will be there. Heroes on the Water will be there this year. Uh, first time for all guys coming out. And then about uh, uh, right before the, the uh, break, going into the second hour, we have, uh, unfortunately, two soldiers uh, that had their freedom ticket punched uh, just for you guys. Uh, for roll call for January 12th. Anyway, Tom, thanks for coming down. Thank you for your service. What what'd you do for the country? Um, well, I was a aircraft mechanic mainly. Really? Yeah, I was. That's a, why you kind of like hanging out with Gettle. That's why I still work on airplanes now, as, as for a living. Really? Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh, here it's Phoenix, Sky Harbor, Southwest Airlines. What do you do? To, Me- what, what kind of stuff do you do? I'm just a mechanic. Do we do everything there, from the tires to the tail, you name it. Check the oil. Remove we feathers do from we the do turbines. That. We yeah. do that. <clears throat> I was a little old school. Cool. I was F4s and A4s, and then I went to Harriers and Hueys and Cobras. So wow. A little bit of everything. What, have you had any experience with the new, what is it, the new F-34? No. Uh-uh. Boy, they sure are noisy. You know, the Marine Corps, they get the last last to get anything. You get the hand-me-downs? Yes. Are you kidding me? You guys are first in. Yeah, I was going to say first, first in, in the, last to get anything. With the oldest equipment. <laughs> By the way, where's the Army this morning? Oops. Do the math. <laughs> what, what I've learned about the Army, and, and I've had this particular discussion, and God love them, I'm not picking on them, but any time that we've had an event, I try to get all of them rounded up, all their stuff rounded up, and get them in the same place at the same time. 
is virtually impossible. I don't know how they attack anybody at the same time. Strategic planning. <laughs> That's why they go in waves. Yeah. Doesn't happen the way uh, no, uh, Sergeant First Class Andy Gettles uh, having to do a PT test today. So we'll have fun with that. I don't know why they, they make him run two miles. He's got a dadgum helicopter. So. I think they just run down for coffee. Perfect. <laughs> they take the bird. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Landing at Starbucks. Oh, that would work. I'd love oh, to see one of those pull into a dude. parking spot. <laughs> I meant to say Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, you should have. I have a Starbucks fixation. Yes, you do. And anyway, uh, at the uh, uh, bottom of the hour, we're going to have the uh, first reading of the chapter three of the book of Dr. Seuss on green eggs and ham. Did you bring me my copy? Would you like to begin? I would. And how was your day yesterday? Um, if you consider going out to the Arizona Game and Fish headquarters, leaving at Always 7 o'clock in the morning, getting out there and sitting around the biggest you know, square table you could possibly imagine, it filled the whole room, and then we wind up sitting there for four solid hours banging at each other's heads about spending money. Yes. And, you know, it was, it's something that I enjoy to the extent that um, we're doing good things for the wildlife that exists in Arizona. You know, we spent well over a million dollars yesterday. And this was through <clears> the uh, – explain the uh, HPC process to the folks. Uh, the HPC process, there's habitat partnership committees all across Arizona and all the small rural as well as the big cities where people can sit um, all during the year and basically come up with ideas to improve habitat for wildlife. Most of the time it's in the rural communities. We've got them in Safford. We've got them in, uh, up in Pine Top Lakeside. We have them in Payson, uh, all across the, the rim country. And the big game animal tags that the Arizona Game and Fish Commission authorizes to each of the critter groups as well as the Arizona Big Game Super Raffle, during the year we auction off those tags and or raffle off those tags. And the Arizona Big Game Super Raffle last year gave a check to the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I think it was for $420,000 nice. for the 10 game animals yeah. that we raffled off. Um, and then in the auction tag basis, uh, I know the Mule Deer, Arizona uh, Deer Association, we raff we auctioned off one tag yet last year. It went for 245000 And then the... Mule Deer Foundation at the big uh, conference up in Salt Lake City, uh, they auctioned theirs off for, I think it was two hundred and thirty or 235000 So we had almost 500000 to deal with, and the elk tag went for almost 600000 between the two tags. So there was a lot of money there, um, and it's very difficult because, as you see my book, you know, my book is about you know three inches thick, and it takes a long time to read through each project and try and get the biggest bang for the well, buck for sportsmen. Well, I had the pleasure of sitting down with you and the rest of the committee and going through the project by project by project, and it's uh, you get a little glazed it, over after a while. Yeah, you, you do uh, for days yeah. because the, uh, and then I find myself going, well, wait a minute. So you're going back and rereading these projects uh, for whatever veracity mm -hmm. uh, they may have. And you try and figure out, you know, the biggest thing that we look for is what we call cost shares, matching matching dollars. If there is something that has a 3 to 1, 4 to 1, where you know, either the um, permittee on an allotment or a private landowner wants to put in a chunk of money and needs help, you know, we love doing that uh, as long as access is involved and we can have permanent hunter access. For the other items, though, we look at... Um, are there other agencies that are cooperating? And we've discussed it in the past, you know, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, so they always contribute NEPA and ARCI work. NEPA is National Environmental Protection Agency um, guidelines that they have to look to make sure the project fits those. ARCI studies are where they go in and they take a look at any of the Native American uh, artifacts that may be in that area. They pinpoint them and they make sure that they're not disrupted. So there's the, there is some money. <clears throat> but I doubt if there's fifty thousand dollars in art clearances whenever they try and throw that in as a cost share match. Yeah. Complicated process. So what's the long and the short of when do these projects uh, actually go in or on the ground? You know, once we approve the funding and the final approval will come on February the second at the Game of Fish meeting, we'll, we have that one more time with all of the HPCs present. 
we go through those and they have a 24 month window in which to be accomplished or at least a portion of them unless we've agreed to staging sure. where there's one you know 30,000 one year 30 the next and 30 the next we've seen projects as up as high as a million dollars which we weren't able to fund that's the request and we've funded as much as 50 to 100,000 dollars where the cost share match was much higher so we we look at them and some of them are as low as you know five thousand dollars. So it's all over the board. Well, last year there was a a pretty cool water catchment up in the White Tanks. So uh, you've got another one going <clears> over uh, Twin Boots. And where Twin Boots? And I confirmed it yesterday with Joe Curry, who's the development branch manager. March fourth through eleventh, we will be up outside of Pumpkin Center. Ooh. You may not be there, but I have to be. March fourth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might make it <clears> a couple of days. Well, we'll be up there Friday, Saturday, which is the 9th, 10th. The 11th, I think, will be kind of pack up and go, finish it off. And then, of course, we're into Bill Luke Bass Days. Nice. Yeah, that I'm looking forward to. Going to be a, a good year. Having said that, uh, you know, we're going to get ready for a break. When we come back, uh, we're going to pick Tom's uh, uh, military mind and uh, have him tell us uh, about some of the nuances of the BassAnglers.com. And do uh, you belong to uh, the Marine anglers as well well it's all army bass anglers but depending what branch you are in well they break it down correct correct pretty interesting all righty having said that we're going to thank some of our sponsors i'm don mcdowell special k tom inman and mac patrick over here we'll be right back that song it's all true all right we're back hey um i want to give a, a shout out to uh western outdoor times jim and carol allen uh were celebrated with uh, media of the year award last night at the uh, commissioner's awards banquet nice job um they do a good job uh with their publications uh western outdoor times and arizona boating and water sports kind of known as the azbw and uh, great job, guys. A uh, couple other things. Uh, where is that one flyer? The uh, Arizona Military Vehicles Collectors Club annual show <coughs> is coming up the 25th and 26th over at Metro Center, uh, which is a new venue. Uh, last couple of years we've had it over at uh, Purio Sports Complex, but they're doing some construction and you can't get the... Uh, large cars in there so metro center's got a huge area and it's not like that's a really well attended uh you know shopping mall that much well they're trying john there's been a resurrection of uh the old metro center uh they had a cruising rule they have figured out that hasn't really worked out Mm -hmm. in their favor because cruisers buy stuff all the time yeah so uh I mean, you don't want to be doing laps around there at high rates of speed because uh, there's a <clears throat> City of Phoenix uh, precinct station right there. But anyway, uh, Saturday and Sunday, 09 to 1600 hours uh, uh, should be a great show. They're going to have some um, big trucks, little trucks, Jeeps, a couple of uh, motorcycles, uh, sidecars, and armament on them. I believe your dad's ridden in... Uh, Half of them. Now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, there's some stuff that's uh, been restored. I don't know if we're going to have any heavy armor uh, this year. Uh, uh, last I heard, there was a half track and, and maybe a tank headed over here from California. So. Ooh, I would love to see a tank come Ooh, through. Raw. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool stuff. And then uh, the um, Baron Smith has a 1960 errors, and maybe you can help me out. What was the little the number on the little bubble helicopter that preceded all of the stuff? Uh, I don't know. It looked like the Channel Three like, News helicopter, like you know, the one that was on Bash. Ago. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And it was probably a general. No, that was Korea. That was a couple of generations after that. That's a million and a half dollar helicopter sitting on his trailer. I mean, little bitty thing, and he's got all of the. Um, 
appropriate display items. He's got uh, Charlie dressed up in the black pajamas, a little oh. little straw hat with the AK-47, the bandoleros. And, yep. You know, the pilot with the 45 at his head. So it's, it's politically correct. It makes a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what country you're in, yeah. We won. They We're in America? <laughs> yeah. They belong to us. Oh, Whatever. Okay. I'm just saying. And then, uh, of course, uh, March 14th, 15th, and 16th, Bill Luke Bass Day is 2014, the 16th annual event. I am looking forward to that. Lake Pleasant, man. I love that event. And uh, Tom's coming out with uh, Army Bass Anglers. Now, you have a rat boat. I, I do. I do. We have a returning heroes home rat boat. Which nice. Is basically an American flag with a big eagle on the side of it. The boat's cool, but she's got a really nice black, shiny ram. Oorah. Mm. Makes nice. the boat look even better. Nice truck. Yeah. The good looking boat. Good looking rig. Thanks. The, the, this is why I'm, I'm telling you, John. You have relatively new stuff. You pull up the launch ramp. You got a hundred thousand dollars rolling in the floor. Oh no question. Huh, no. Just, I boom. can't see the Prius being able to back it in, but maybe it'll do it. <laughs> you you got front wheel drive. It'll back it in. It won't pull it back out. Yes, though. it will. It'll <laughs> pull oh, anything out. Yeah, it'll back it all the way. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Well, well, well. Oh, tension on the flight deck. Uh, all hands no. on deck. All hands on deck. <laughs> it's the sergeant. Oh no. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that because I'm working today, actually. So. And you're doing a fine job as well. Yeah, this is uh, this is what happens when uh, you get involved with people like you. you get- <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is the best of times. You oh, don't want to see the worst of times with him. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Oh, you know that pay raise you wanted? Just yeah, forget, it's gone. It. Yeah, yeah, all right. Done. It's just yeah. chalking it to my other failures I think there's a presidential life. solution that's yeah. taking care of that. Good morning, Tom. How Good are you? Good morning, Andy. <laughs> uh, nice. Anyway, we're talking about Army Bass Anglers uh, showing up at uh, our 16th annual Bill Luke Bass Days, and uh, you're going to be a big part of that. Uh, what are you guys going to do? Well, we're going to have a booth there. Um, we're going to try to sell shirts, stuff, whatever, raise money. We work, and we raise money for several nonprofits. Returning Heroes Home, Heroes on the Water, which is our designated nonprofit here in the West Side. Nice. And a Soldier's Child Foundation, which is the newest nonprofit that we've picked up as an organization. Out here, we're going to be raising money for Heroes on the Water, and I believe we're going to have Heroes on the Water representatives out there with us. We're going to be having a raffle, raffling off a big ice hole cooler, like a Yeti Ooh, on steroids. I had an idea for a fundraiser. Can you raffle off a ride in uh, Sergeant Andy's Blackhawk? Well, that's that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, let me tell you, there's some uh, there's some restrictions on it though. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is there a raffle for a ride? Yeah, Serious? sure. Yeah. First thing you got to do is you got to go down to the local recruiting station, <laughs> and you have to enlist. Dude, if they took me, I'd do it. Yeah. Well, that's the only way I can get you a ride in a Blackhawk. Sorry. And then he still can't guarantee it. And then I still can't guarantee it. I'm not it. in that raffle either. I I didn't hit the age restriction. <sighs> yeah, you you passed your age restriction about 20 years ago. Don. You know, when Desert Storm started, I went down. Did you really? I did. I've done that three different times. The first one was the. Uh, five or seven day war with israel had a jewish brother-in-law and he goes you want to go i'm going yeah let's do it by the time we got signed up it was the over game was over i'm serious it was I it, remember it, that. it started and i i went down to well, right around the corner seventh street in indian school nah nah it's uh i was uh i'd been in the army two years in desert storm Already. Really? Yeah. It's where I made my first stripes, actually. Hmm. Desert Storm. 101st Airborne at that time. So no Blackhawk rides, even if I sign up. No. You just, yeah. You're way too old to sign up. We've got, we've got, <laughs> we've got, we've got that a, is unkind. We have a better chance of aerial coyote gunning That's true. in yeah, northern hey, Arizona. Yeah, yeah, not with us, though. No, we yeah, have. So we, we, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe some we, of the stuff that we have restrictions on. Yeah, but you wouldn't believe some of the stuff we have in garage. That's right. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, borrow, what, you I know heard you, I heard I heard the station on the way in. You could borrow the helicopter off the guy's the back of his trailer that the OV1 that uh, or the OH1 that That's he has. It. It. Yeah, That's no, it. yeah, OH1. Yeah. It's restored. Uh, it's been restored. It'll start. It's insured for two million dollars. Nice. 
Alrighty, having uh, said that, when we come back, Andy's in the barrel. Oh, God. Yeah. We'll be out with a 410 and move to a 20 gauge. Uh-huh. Every squirrel and rabbit in Dallas County knew my name. <laughs> All right, and we're back. Uh, we're going to learn about ArmyBassAnglers.com from uh, Andy and Tom. So between you guys, what is it? Do you want to start, Andy? Uh, uh, yeah, I can start. Do I, they I, have helicopters? No, they do not have helicopters. They but really you fish g- from them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just no. the ones with skids. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> nice. Uh, stupid birds. <laughs> Um, no, here's, here's, and I'll tell you, I got involved with it because just of what I do for a living, but those guys, you know, I looked it up and, and I kind of, uh, made some inquiry, inquiries and, uh, Tom was kind enough to call me back and we met up a couple of times and I joined. But, uh, one of the things that I really liked about it was the fact that they actively pursue, um, raising money for military charities, charities that, benefit military members whether they're retired whether they're disabled whether they're still active whether they're uh served two years or 26 years it doesn't matter if if you've served this organization was started by military members it's run by military members um it's it's uh and it raises a lot of money across the nation for military charities and those charities are um very important uh, especially when you consider that we've been at war in this country, and, and the military has been at war since 2001, basically. Since and the beginning. Since the beginning. I mean, yeah. you know, and and it has not stopped. That's what I, we do. We prepare for war, go to war, take some time off, prepare for some more war. Go to work. And yeah. do we'll go to again. work. Yeah. Okay, so basically if somebody has served in the military and they have children, yeah, you will do whatever you possibly can to help them. Yeah, it's it's the that that uh that military child charity mm-hmm. and really what that is 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 if you've lost a family member, if you've lost a dad or a mom mm-hmm. um uh serving overseas, that charity comes in with enough money to send that kid to college mm-hmm. to pay their expenses to help out. They they dump a lot of money on the survivors. So it's not just the military, it's, it's, it's their families and survivors. The one that we concentrate on here in Arizona though is Heroes on the Water. Nice. Yeah. And, and Heroes on the Water, in fact, I just got off the phone yesterday with Jim Dolan in Texas. I talked to him. He's the founder of Heroes on the Water. Um, they contacted me because, um, they knew I was coming on this radio station and they just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, Phil Tumbleson is the uh, Phil Tumbleson is the uh, local director here in Arizona, and they're just getting wound up. So we're really excited about an opportunity to go to Build the Fast Days and raise some money for those guys because they need it. What they need is what they do is they take soldiers that have served or have uh, suffered some sort of debilitating injury, whether it be overseas or even in training, mm-hmm. and they'll take them out in a kayak and they go fishing. Mm-hmm. And what the, it's just a fishing day, and then they serve them dinner afterwards. So one of the key things about this is is, is since 2001 or 2003, really, is when, when Iraq was the biggest of the campaigns started, right. that those guys were going out. And if you, look at, if you look at the history of what went on in Iraq between the Army and the Marine Corps Man. in particular, those guys are um, – I read an interesting statistic a couple weeks ago. In Vietnam, the average month spent in combat was 15 months. That's what your average soldier spent in combat. You know, they got drafted. They in, went to in Vietnam. In terms of months? In, in terms of months. I they got it, drafted. I have it down in days, too. Yeah, they have, a, they have it where you got drafted. <laughs> you went through basic training, whatever your AIT is, whatever they said you were going to do. Yeah. You went to Vietnam. You served your tour, and then you were released from the military you did your tour and some didn't some did multiple tours and they were career you know ncos and officers but um in our all volunteer army right now um the average month spent in a combat zone for your average soldier that's serving today and i can only speak for the army is 45 months since 2003 45 months these guys have spent in a combat zone whether they're door kickers or uh you know clerks 
It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's hard to come home after that. It, it's really hard to come home, and, and you know, and everybody kind of you can you can guff wad all the clerks you want, but I was at Balad for I was at Balad for eight or nine months in uh, in in Iraq in 2004. We got mortared every single day. In fact, the nickname of the place was Mortaritaville. It just it happened. The, the <laughs> alarm would go <laughs> off. It, it got to the point where the alarm would go off, and you'd like, eh, nobody would run to the bunker anymore. You just keep going about your work. And if it came close, it came close. You know, it just, oh hey, look at that. That one was a close one. You went back to work, and that you kind of kind of become conditioned to that. Well, that's, it. that's the conditioning of the mental aspect yeah, of living your, in that environment. It's your brain justifying <laughs> your work. You know, right. it's, you've got to you've got to change you've got to change who you are in order to That's do your what we do. Shutting down. You well, call it's whatever just you yeah, want and it, you know, you you do horrible things yeah. to you know horrible people in horrible countries, and and you have to be able to justify that. Well, you come home to the United States. I was driving up Thomas when I went back to work. They were doing some road construction, and some guy hit a jackhammer. You know, Oops. while he was, and I literally, I'm driving in my truck, and I literally dove on the floorboard of the passenger seat, doing 35 miles an hour up Thomas. You know, it instantly Reflex. got back up. Yeah, instantly got yeah. back up again, grabbed all my wheel, going, "Holy crap! I'm uh, I'm yeah. a little more screwed up than I thought I was." <laughs> you know, <laughs> we could have told but, you that. But yeah, yeah I know yeah. that. Yeah, but here's what Heroes on the Water does: is anybody that's ever been fishing on quietly someplace knows that water attacks all five senses of the body right it it you hear it you see it you smell it you feel it it's it's soothing it takes you it takes you don't if you're a if you're a soldier you're a lawyer whatever it takes you out of that world and all you worry about at those particular times is um Fishing or boating or just being quiet for a few minutes. It's called just being. Just, just being, being in nature. Right. And, Starts kicking and, in and, your and sixth here's, sense. Yeah, and exactly. So you're you're you can literally on the water you can remove yourself from whatever, mm -hmm. and then you couple that with oaring exercises where you're getting some physical in, un, unlike you know getting in a bass boat or whatever and doing 65 miles an hour across the water. Yeah, you're losing some it, of that uh, sensory deal when you do that with Don. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty. Uh, wakes you up pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it'll, it'll, well, yeah. it'll wake you. It'll wake you. Oorah! Yeah, you're in, in the tinnitus in your ears. You know, it'll calm down about noon. What's yeah. that? But the but these guys. Day. But these guys. Yeah, the next day. But these guys go out and they and they row around. And he and and Tom or Jim Dolan was telling me that he says it's the funniest thing. He says you launch them and there'll be twenty five or thirty guys show up. The kayaks are provided, the PFDs are provided, the fishing equipment is provided. That's what mm -hmm. Heroes on the Water does. And then afterwards, they provide a meal for these guys, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be burgers or dogs, I don't know. Hot but, dog. Yeah. We fish, get a hot dog. Get a hot dog, yeah. $200 hot dog. Yeah, $300 hot dog, right? Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, they let them go, and they don't – it's not a contest. It's right. nothing. It's like point them that way. Give them some tips. They do a couple of drills. Hey, if you fall off this thing, this is how you get back on this thing, right. that kind of thing. Just keep rolling. And just keep rolling. He says, it's really funny. He says, they all take off, and they all go in different directions. And about an hour into it, what you find is there will be a group of them here, and they're all kind of glommed in together. And there will be a group of them here, and they're glommed in together. And then you'll have one or two guys that are just off by themselves. And – and uh leave them alone they're not fishing yeah. they're 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 <laughs> Just being they're, they're relaxed and they're a bunch of military guys that sit around and they all speak the same language and they all have similar life experience and they and they find that it just it relaxes them. It puts them in a state that they can talk to each other right. and say, "Hey, this is these are the issues I'm having. Uh, hey, this is the solution that I found for stuff like that." So yeah, it. Very important to a guy like me that organizations like that exist. Are these uh, guys that part participate from the uh, military side, are they uh, generally amputees or are you taking uh, PTSD issues or we take how them, deep does it go? It, it takes as deep as the guy is willing to go. So, you know, there is – there's little risk that they're going to drown because they're required to wear a PFD. PFDs, yeah. But they got to be able to get back in the boat. And there's a guy in Texas, I guess, that is a triple amputee. And I'll tell you, I hear the music, and we'll tell that guy's yeah. story after Hold this. Hold that thought. We've got, uh, I gave uh, J.K. the uh, 
I think that's that guy right in the middle of the trifold. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah. Right, hey, yeah, um, is. Yeah. Stay with us. This is pretty interesting. I'm Don McDowell with Tom Inman, Andy Guttel, and J.K. All right, we're back. Uh, Blackhawks flying around, going up, going down. Oh, they no. go up, they come down. All right, you were you were talking. Uh, go right ahead, Sergeant Andy. What was I talking about? Uh, Heroes on the water. Heroes, Heroes on the water. water. On the water. Okay. Water. So, getting back to Heroes on the water, one of the one of the big issues that we have in the military right now. Anybody that served overseas, especially if you're an outside the wire guy, a, a door kicker. Mm-hmm. Um, these guys are getting. I flew back on leave in a C-130 with an infantry colonel and an infantry first sergeant when I was coming home in 2004. And um, the guy said, and we just started talking about what we do. And, you know, and I've, been, I've been fixing and flying on UH-60 Blackhawks my entire career. And the guy basically told me this colonel, he says, your job is worth its weight in blood. And I kind of thought, well, that's kind of a silly thing to say. And they said, no, he says, what you don't understand is we go out every day, drive these roads, and we find seven, eight, nine, ten IEDs a day. Mm-hmm. And it's the one you don't find, the one that you missed, is yeah. the one that gets you. And it just takes one to get you. Yep. And these guys are finding ten a day and are losing, at that time, you were losing, you know, five, six soldiers a month to an IED attack. And... um what an, I, an IED is, uh, it, for anybody that doesn't know what it is by now, it's an, um, uh, it's an improv- improvised. improvised explosive device. So they take, in, in Iraq in particular, there are 155 howitzer shells everywhere. Everybody has a bomb in their backyard, whether they know it or not. It's not like the, it's not like the United States where, oh, you, you know, nobody has C4. Everybody has C4. You're, nobody has 22s either. Yeah, nobody has 22s either. But everybody has everybody has some sort of automatic weapon. Everybody over there has access to high explosives, and they wire this stuff up. And at the time, they were detonating them with you know cords, or they were detonating them with cell phones, or whatever. But these guys drive along, and <clears throat> these bombs go off. And if it doesn't kill you, the concussion alone causes what's TB. It's called TBI now. It, and that's traumatic brain, brain injury. injury. Yeah. It, it's the same thing that the NFL is fighting right now. These guys are getting slammed in the cockpit of their vehicles so hard that the brain is slamming up against the inside of their skull. And that well, winds up with brain shear. I'm real familiar with yeah. that. Right. <clears throat> and, and one of the things that they're finding is it's not just a physical inju- injury. It's a mental one as well. It changes. It rewires your brain every time that happens. It's every all circuitry. T- it's exactly. And and the brain will compensate. Well, when it's compensating, it's compensating in the worst of environments, right? You're yep. in a war zone, and your brain is starting to rewire itself. And it rewires itself to the point where you come home, and these guys, they see it. They see this is not Iraq. They see this is not Afghanistan. Brain's not telling you that. But the brain is so conditioned, especially these door kickers, these guys that have been outside the wire and dealing with the indigenous personnel there, and you can't trust any of them. You know what I mean? Because you don't know which one of them is the bad guy. Mm No. And and it's very hard for them to unwind. It's very hard for them to... Put all that aside. It's very, and it's hard for me too. And I'm, I'm not a door kicker. I am not. Did I you, might. Do I understand you had a little time in Fallujah? Uh, yeah, I've been to Fallujah and Ramadi. Very. It, you need often. to get another travel agent. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> country. Iraq's a, it, actually Iraq reminds you <clears> of <throat> when you fly up the the uh, Tikrit and in between the Tikrit and the Euphrates River. I grew up here in Arizona. I was born and raised here in Arizona. It reminds me of old Phoenix. The date farms, the farm fields, the water, the irrigation canals, all that stuff. When I and I'm 47 years old, so uh, you know, good. Wow, you are that old. Yeah, I am. You look older. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, if I let the beard grow, I really got the gray going. Um, But uh, but uh, the wow. Yeah, where were we? I'm feeling the love. Let's talk about. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Uh, no, but so you, these guys are. They're not screwed up. They're not. They're they're dealing with stuff that 99.9 percent of the American population 
they cannot relate to. Can't yeah. comprehend it. They just mm-hmm. they can't put their they can't put their minds about it. And 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 I and I'd say this too that most people that have never served in any branch of the military they don't we don't communicate the same way. I, it, Tom and I can communicate very well because even though we served in different services uh it just so happens we're both old helicopter guys. We're both and we speak a com there's a commonality between Correct. us. Right, that we speak the same language. Well, what Heroes on the Water does is it takes those guys, it puts them in a very calm, soothing environment, and it shoves them out in the middle of the lake, and it says, De-stress. We're going to stay out of your way, guys. Have a nice day. Have a nice yeah. day. But getting back to these joint amputees and, and, and these guys, there's a, there's a guy in Texas, and, and it's not uncommon that... Guys, obviously, anybody that loses their leg, it's a traumatic thing, not just physically, but mentally as well. There, there's there's multiple amputees coming out of these theaters of war because of sure. the nature of the weapon. Is there any statistics uh, about Arizona? Uh, there are. I can tell you how many Arizona guys we've lost, how many guys that we've lost that have been deployed from here, but, you know, trying to get DODs. Stats on WIAs is and, and, virtually impossible. Yeah, and that stuff's out there. It's here's the one thing, and, and it's really, and we've had this discussion before. There's there's been four or five thousand since the war on terror started. There's been four or five thousand people killed in in war. However, there are hundreds of thousands of injured coming home because of the nature of medical uh, technology. They're able to save so many more soldiers that otherwise would have been lost yes. in World War II or even Korea or even Vietnam. Um, the level of medical training for just Joe on the on the street, he knows what an old World War II medic used to know. You know what I mean? Now, uh, uh, the an army soldier. Yeah, the soldier is a- self help is is at the level of a medic in World War II. The medics now in the military true of the Marine Corps, true of the Army, true of uh, the Air Force and the Navy as well, those guys, well, actually the Navy is the corpsman for the Marines. I want to but, give a shout out to my uh, yeah, my favorite Navy corpsman. Yeah. Level docs. Yeah, there you go. But those guys, those guys are paramedics. You know, they're, they're what fire department rolls to your house when you're having a, a heart attack. And they can do a lot. Now, obviously they're geared for traumatic injury, but those guys are paramedics now. They come out of the military paramedic service. We have, I had a, uh, two years ago, we'll have the same guys back uh, a couple times. Hopefully we'll have them back this year, but they're frontline uh, first respond medics. I'll tell you what, man, God bless them. Oh, yeah. God bless them. Yeah, you talk about a nervous system that's kind of fouled up. Well, you know, you see the worst of the worst of the worst. You well, see you the can. results. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have a medevac unit out at the hangar, and, and they just got back from my uh, from Afghanistan. And I tell you, I don't. I've never been in a medevac service. I've been an assault guy my entire career. And thank you, thank you, God, for that. Yeah. Because I'm not sure I could mentally handle what those guys have mm. to handle. Well, I'm going to interrupt everybody. We're going to do a roll call for. Whoa. January 12th. Unfortunately, uh, this past week we've lost two soldiers in combat. Don't know what the uh, wounded in action is, but uh, the first soldier, uh, Marine Sergeant Jacob M. Hess, died January 1st, uh, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. 22 years old, of Spokane, Washington. Sergeant was assigned to the Marine Aviation Logistics Squadron 26, Marine Aircraft Group 26, 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing, 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Died January 1st, 2014 while serving uh, combat operations in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. Army Sergeant First Class William K. Lacey died January the 4th, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. He was 38 years old of Laurel Hill, Florida. Signed to the 201st Brigade Support Battalion, 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 1st Entry Division out of Fort Knox, Kentucky. He died on January the 4th in Nangarhar Province, Afghanistan, of injuries sustained when the enemy attacked his unit with rocket-propelled grenades. That's a price of freedom for you guys this week. Think about it. Think about we'll it. Right, 
Jake Rattle and Troll is brought to you by Bill Luke Dodge Chrysler Jeep. Now, here's your host, saltwater fisherman and tournament pro, Don McDowell. Yeah, man. Hey, Don McDowell. Welcome you to the second hour of Shake, Rattle, and Troll. We're enjoying the company of uh, Tom Emmon. Who's and, dancing uh, to your theme music right now? It's a little disturbing. Hey. <laughs> hey. Andy. That would be... <laughs> Behave uh, yourself. Andy Gettle. Talking about the nuances of uh, Army Bass Anglers and uh, all the service, uh, anglers.com uh, and some of the good things that uh, Heroes on the Water are doing. Uh Going into the next uh, break, we're going to be talking to uh, Fisheries Branch Chief Chris Cantrell. And, uh, you know, I've said it before, and uh, I think it's worth repeating one more time. This Fisheries Branch Chief that we have right now is the strongest Fisheries Chief that we've had in my lifetime at the department. He's engaged. He gets it. Got a vision. Getting it done. So, well, yeah. he's, now, he's also not a career uh, bureaucrat. Um, I don't think he's interested in protecting his position as much as he's interested in making some changes. Yep, lock, load, pull the string, get exactly. it done, boom, boom. So anyway, eight fifteen, uh, Roosevelt Lake update. You guys are gonna love this. But back to you guys, uh, uh, Andy and uh, Tom. Um, what, what's the uh, normal uh, operating uh, procedure for uh, Heroes on the Water? How, how does one get signed up? to contact them, to yeah. contact a soldier, how does this all work here? Well, and, and again, I, this is a fledgling organization here in Arizona. This is a widespread and very in-depth uh, organization in Texas, in California, and all Texas of them. Texas does everything big. I, well, mm-hmm. it's because they have tons of water. It's a lot yeah. easier. You know, we, we're just limited on water here. So the first thing that people think about is not getting them out and going fishing. It's doing other things. Um, right now, the best way to contact it is go through the website. Go through the website, and uh, you can click on a chapter, Southwest Chapter. They have their own little subpage in there, and there's contact information in there for the guys that are running it. They, uh, or you can just post a, hey, I want to do this. The other thing is uh, Tom, I, and Phil went down to the Army National Guard Joint Service Support Center, which is kind of the – kind of the hub where all of the military um uh i don't i don't know how to all of the military organizations that come in to help uh whether it be a wounded warrior project is uh, that the uh, military, part of one source yeah it's all part of one okay. source you can go down there contact them and tell express an interest in i want to go to a heroes on the water event and they will contact Phil, and they will organize it. Now, let me just say this. If there's any vets out there listening that want or are interested in this, you provide nothing. You show up. You show up. If you want to show up with your son, you want to show up with your daughter and do it, they will accommodate it. They have the kayaks. They have. They are trying to get a hold of the fishing gear, which is one of the big reasons why we're showing up to Bill Luke Bass Day nice. to raise the money to have quality fishing gear available that is compatible with all levels of uh, skill, whether it be a baitcaster, uh, spinning spinning gear, ultralight gear, fly rod, whatever. They will provide that for you. They will provide the kayak. They will provide some remi- uh, some intermittent training in you know showing you how to get off and on the thing without killing yourself. Um, they will assist in any way that is necessary. They don't want to assist an able-bodied person because they don't want to make anybody feel like oh you know we know something you don't. Get out there in that boat. Go out and paddle around. They're planning on doing events up in the northern waters for trout and the southern waters for bass. Uh, down in Tucson, they're planning on stuff. They're, they they want to spread out across the state as much as possible. And uh, by all means, if there's any listeners out there that are interested in this, contact through the website, contact through the uh, Arizona Army National Guard Joint Service Support Center, uh, they will get you in contact with Phil, and um, he will coordinate. I guarantee I know that guy very well. He will bend over backwards to get even if it's one soldier on the water. Well, can they go right straight to Heroes on the Water? Absolutely. Okay. That's, yeah, that's the absolutely. website. It's that's heroesonthewater.org. Right. Yeah, .org. Yeah. .org. Yeah. Go to armybassanglers.com also, and yeah. you'll have a link through that. Yeah. Speak about a little bit about what we do, what... Army Bass Anglers is... We're an all-military organization of, of, for fishing. Um, veterans, active duty, retired, 
as long as you're in the military, you're eligible. And we support Defend Fish. That's our motto. Support. We raise money through fishing activities, boat shows, whatnot, big bass days. We raise for our charities, such as Heroes on the Water. Last year, we raised over $80,000, just just us raising it. Um, out here in the West Coast, we're, we're growing. We need members. We need participation. We need shows to work, raffles to do. Um, just the opportunity. I yeah, think. exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we need people to take out on a, we'll, we'll take them out on our boats. Um, anybody's interested. You don't have to be a tournament angler. You just, no. you just have to want to, to help. And it's a brotherhood. It really is. Just like Andy was saying earlier, we all speak the same language. Even if you were in the army, we understand you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I think my dad's it's lining little, up right now. It, oh, getting yeah. ready. He's it's listening little, on the air it's today. It's actually a little tough to understand a Marine. Is it? Well, who was here on time? <laughs> <laughs> Linguistic abilities of Marines is now being challenged. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. But dude. <laughs> No, wow. but it's it, and that's that's kind of why I was gravitated to army bass anglers. It's just that it's I love fishing. I have my own boat. You know, I can go out and do it by myself all day long. I've been, you know, I've dabbled a little bit in the tournament scene around Arizona, but these guys we can sit around and we, you know, he tells he tells stories about when he was in the in the in the core and I tell stories about what I did yesterday. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we have our own <laughs> ancient history versus reality exactly. today. We have our own TV show. Uh, Tom, I'm not sure, but I think that was You were dead. just real. Whoa. In case Bam. you didn't catch that, it went right through you. Yeah. 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 You yeah. know, we have our own TV show called Force on Force on the uh, World Fishing Network. And that's what it's about. Anybody that's in the organization is eligible to go for the casting call and actually go fishing. And it's a one-day tournament. Branch against branch, and that's all it is. It's trash Ooh, talking. That's a gun fight. It is. It's a it, lot of fun. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a television show on how the military can trash talk each other without and saying something that gets you beeped. And that's what it is. And you get out there and you fish, and it's just a great time. Yeah. And, and that's fun stuff. It yeah. is. It's a lot of fun. You know, Don, you have that face made for radio. You might want to try out for that. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we, we try to do our part, and uh, I'm just elated that uh, you guys are going to be out at uh, Bass Days. Uh, we'd like, we'd yeah, like to we're thank very, you for the opportunity. Yeah, we're very excited about being there. A couple of things that, that come to mind. You know, we lift in, a, and I'm not really going to get on a soapbox. Uh, if I do, John kick me off of it. But we, we live in a 50% society. You can tell that by the voting habits, uh, and, and I'll just sum that up by saying 50% of the people just don't give a damn. And uh, they're really not engaged on what's happening in the military, what the military is doing, has done, or what's being done to the military. And uh, all to effect, I ran into uh, uh, a pastor friend of mine yesterday at, at the Home Depot, and he said, what are you doing? And I had just gotten roll call, and and I kind of lock horns with my church on, you know, there are certain times of the year that we, you know, as, as a church, people are fighting and dying to preserve that particular right for them to express their religious freedom and, and not to properly address what goes on uh, every week. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a travesty, and, and, and uh, we're, we're trying to change that. Uh, and I think Big Bass Days or Bill Bass Days is a is an opportunity to uh, meet and greet the public. Uh, awful lot of veterans go out there and they fish. They're there, and everybody's got somebody that's been in the military, either past, present, or current. Um, so, yeah, it, it it's a big deal, and I'm really glad you guys are going to be there. Yeah, we're really we're, looking forward to the opportunity. Cornhole tournament challenge is now there. Us against the military. You go right ahead. Bring it. Yeah, cornhole. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Not you do a not want to get up against the recruiters. <laughs> no, I know the recruiters are good. Yeah. Let's, let's have I think they yeah, do the, that all day. The, the, the wolf pack? Yeah. They, they should rename them the beanbag pack. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Haven't said that. When we come back, Chief Cantrell. Rubbing her back just kills me. All right, I don't know if that, that particular uh, 
George Strait too is appropriate for Keith, Chief Cantrell, but yeah, why not? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Oh, Keith Cantrell's got to be just green with envy at the two million dollars we had yesterday oh, going yeah, out the door. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we uh, how we get some of the HPC money for bass projects. You know, you get one bass that weighs 17 pounds, and you 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 know where he's got. You put him in a lake, and you get, have a guy who can fish that lake all year long, all by himself to catch it. You know, that's how you do it. Okay. And he's Good morning, Chief. It. How are you? <laughs> Good morning, guys. Boy, it's been a long day already. Has it? Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us. I know you were working hard yesterday uh, with the commission, and uh, J.K. was out with the HPC guys. I went and had a steak, which is the best part of it. So. In your attitude. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it was all good. Uh, the awards banquet, uh, very well presented, and uh, our congratulations out to uh, Jim and Carol Allen at uh, Western Outdoor Times. So, I know you've been working really, really, really hard uh, at the department. Uh, what's the news you'd like to share on uh, Roosevelt? Well, uh, we have been working with a number of partners. Uh, we've been working internally, and... Uh, Rough numbers are in. We plan on redirecting about $356,000 towards Roosevelt Lake over the next year and a half. Uh, it's a multifaceted wow. program that's going to be directed at Roosevelt Lake. Uh, starts with communication. We're going to continue to communicate with our partners and with uh, 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 local anglers um, and other interested parties through our roundtables, um, and the next one will be coming up in February, March, uh, and then after that in, uh, in June, and we'll just continue that on um, through uh, right now, tentatively through t- 2016. The second part of that is our habitat per, um, uh, program. Uh, we know the lake is devoid of habitat, so we are planning, we have redirected one full-time position that will focus this intent over the next year and a half and and potentially longer on Roosevelt Lake to develop a habitat management plan. And that person just recently accepted the position, um, and we're still working out the details, and I don't have the name of that person yet, but we'll be having a new person that its sole focus for the next year and a half will most likely be um, all Roosevelt Lake uh, habitat-related work. So that, that's, that's great. That, that project is going to kick off. Um, our stocking program is the next uh, facet of the program, and this one's pretty interesting. So we've been working, I've been working over the last month or so with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Everybody says if you want Florida strain, you just go straight to the source. You don't go through the middleman. You don't go through another state that gets it in. You go to Florida. So I called for that to Florida, and we've been talking quite a bit, and they've agreed to become a partner in this effort. They will be uh, working with us uh, in the first week of March. We'll be sending two employees to Florida to train under them to take a look at the uh, uh, at the uh, Florida Strain uh, Bass Conservation Center. Um, they'll be working with their hatchery operations and staff. Um, there uh, at, at Webster, Florida, and uh, taking a look at all of the intricacies of the hatchery program, what uh, what um, uh, needs are for our system in bubbling ponds fish hatchery, and we will be uh, they they have identified excess fish fry. Now we don't know numbers at this point, but I expect that it will be somewhat significant amount of numbers for a first time stocking in 2014 at Roosevelt Lake. So. Those fry will come, be flown from Western or from Webster, uh, Florida, to um, or probably out of Orlando or Tampa to Phoenix Sky Harbor. They'll be picked up, ran up to uh, Bubbling Pond, and put into our facility to grow. Um, this is the first step in potentially looking to see if systems are conducive to uh, creating brood stocks here in the state. So, Chief, um, are we going to go through the uh, exercise to uh, tag these little guys? Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the parts of our last facet of this is our research and monitoring, and part of that is to look at the stocking uh, uh, efficacy of uh, of our stocking program there. So, um, are we being effective? Uh, at what size is the most effective on stocking? I know in the Golden Alga 
project, it identified six to eight inch uh, bass was the most effective um, stocking. But uh, if you call for a six to eight inch four strain bass, you get laughed at because there's just nobody that keeps them on. They grow so fast that from one to two inch bass, a one to two inch bass uh, is what they push off station right away in, in March, March, April. So we'll be getting, they, they have, uh, Webster will be sending us those, those fry fingerling at one to two inches. We'll grow them a little bit larger. And then we'll probably, and we'll either put them in right before the summer or we'll be putting them in early, right as soon as the temperatures cool down at Roosevelt Lake. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. I'm pretty excited because now we have, like, the key partner in becoming successful in stocking. And, and uh, and we are stocking this year. So, Chief, is there any concern at all on challenges about a, this being a non-native species? There, there are no challenges. Bass, uh, largemouth bass, are in Roosevelt Lake. Mm-hmm. So, all any of our actions that we're doing will not contribute to any additional impacts to non-native species. I mean, essentially. We're not, we're not, um, adding anything that isn't already there that has the potential already. I know there have been some people who have talked about the fact that we have Rocky Mountain elk instead of Merriman elk in Arizona. And I'm, you know, as nebulous as that sounds, that is a factor in some of the litigation that we've faced in the past. Sure. Sure. And I'm sure we might hear something here and there, but we're very confident that, uh, that our actions are no different than what was currently on the landscape. Okay. So, uh, so uh, you know, and, and we have stopped Florida strain in Roosevelt before. So, oh. so nothing new to the system there. Good. Um, however, we haven't stopped it since the seventies and the eighties. So, and and if you talk to any state that that has a Florida strain stocking program, it is the key to being successful when you have a downturn in numbers and sizing on fish. Florida talks, you know, have talked to me about a number of uh, examples. Even in their state, they have a transition zone that's uh, in the northern part of the state that has both northern and Florida strain, and they have specific examples of lakes that have gone through exactly what uh, Roosevelt's gone, gone through, where they have largemouth bass fires, gizzard shad, fluctuating reservoir and golden alga, all competing as their, as villains in this lake that, that create, um, uh, bad conditions for, for their sport fish. And they go through these downturns and, and what they've seen is if they take good Florida strain genetics and they stock on a regular basis in the lake, they've been able to turn them into some of their best fisheries. Texas has identified over 63 reservoirs in the state where you can catch over a 13-pound bass. That is fantastic, and that is what we want to do in Arizona. Chief, uh, what, what are your thoughts on a potential uh, golden alga kill in well, 14? Well, it is risky, and this is why we had decided that we would focus on management efforts versus a big research study. Um, a major research study would mean hold tight, don't change any of the controls, any of the variables, don't do anything right now, and continue to monitor and monitor all the variables. But we're concerned that something may happen in the next year, like a gold malga, which would throw all that data out the window, which is why we wanted to focus now on management versus, um, versus research um, at the lake. So there is a potential that we do have a gold malga kill. And, and um, right now we're at 50% at the lake level, and, um, and it's probably going to continue to drop. The snow level is not, not there in eastern Arizona, and unfortunately when lake levels drop... Okay, Chief, we got to go, no man. Uh, have a great All weekend. Right. We'll talk to you, buddy. Great job, Chief. Can't All right, thank you. Yeah. In the shade, there's nobody there at my honey hole. Looks like I got it made, and now I've caught a big one. So forget that hourglass. If you just wait a minute, then we both can kiss my bass, kiss my bass. <laughs>
kiss my bag. I'm going fishing. All righty then, lady, let's go fishing with our master rod builder, James Guggenauer from Room Country Custom Rods with the Room Country Fishing Report. Brother James, what is happening? Hey, what can I say? We are on cloud nine up here in Basin this morning. <laughs> and but, you're on cloud nine because why? Well, we got news of uh, the changes of Roosevelt Lake that the commission was going to make. Uh, you know, we've been holding our roundtable meetings for some time now, and uh, that is absolutely good news. So we're going to uh, get some action. Well, you know, there's a lot of people to thank, but the uh, bottom catalyst of that is the uh, actions, the uh, vision, and the uh, tenacity of Chief Cantrell. Absolutely. Period. And the little burr in his side known as Don McDowell. Yeah, well, 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 you know, he's doing such a good job. You know, I've talked to Chris about this and, and made public statements. We haven't had a, a fisheries branch chief forever until we had uh, Chief Cantrell. So. It's a better place, and in, 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 uh, coupled with that, we've got an extremely strong uh, commission, and I, I look for some good things to happen. Uh, I think 2014 ultimately is going to be a tough year fighting the, the other fights that we have, but I think uh, the battle space on uh, Roosevelt is pretty well uh, <clears throat> uh, taken care of with uh, Chief Cantrell, and I hope that uh, Tonto National Forest, the BLM, and SRP, and the Corps of Engineers they get all their cooperative acts together and uh, don't become a roadblock in the effort, uh, especially where uh, habitat's concerned. So, anyway, how's Absolutely. your day? <laughs> Doing well. Hey, ambient temperatures down in Tonto Basin and Roosevelt Lake this week have been in the mid to high 60s with a lot of sunshine. Now, local anglers called fishing good this past week on Roosevelt. Now, the water level remains at 47% full. However, the flows into the lake have fallen below our normal rates this time of year. There's some serious concern that we're not getting as much moisture as we thought we'd have. And I uh, hate to see hate to see us go, go below the average level. So hopefully we'll get some storms up here on the watershed for Wellsville Lake. Yeah, there has, there's been really limited on that, Jim. There's been no snows that I can see coming through at all, and I noticed when I've driven up there that it's really starting to get dry again. Yeah. It does have that, that look to it. Uh, and, you know, the thing that, that we're saying is if we start the season off at 47% full, that's going to be a pretty dramatic road. Uh, drawdown for Roosevelt to the next spring and summer. Well, I'm curious to see what SRP's posture going to be is going to be with the drawdowns of uh, Bartlett versus Roosevelt and how far they're going to take one or the other end or both. Right. Still, still waiting for that information, but you're right, Don. That will that will uh, make a big difference whichever way they. Well, start. we've got another one suffering. Uh, last time I checked, Alamo was at nine nine percent. <laughs> Um, and then the surface water, uh, this is uh, still pretty good. We're still in the low 50s in the surface water temperature on Rosebell Lake. So um, that being said, in the clear sunshine and the little bit of warmth we're having here, you know, the top technique that was reported this past week was the drop shot, even more so than a spoon. I was kind of surprised by that. Guys are using a 6-inch dark-colored robo-worm. And if we had to give an example of a, a dark robo worm, that would be an Aaron's Magic color. Now, other techniques that were uh, given this week was a black or brown color, 3H to 1.5 ounce G, deep running crankbaits. And you're going to like this, Don, because I heard reports in the chrome with a black color stripe on it were working well. Bingo. <laughs> and, of course, jigging spoons this time of year for deeper fish. Now, the one report I got, this is kind of contradictory because I talked to two different anglers. One guy was fishing deep, said that he has actually moved from the 40 to 50 uh, depth down to the 50 to 60 depth for chicken spoons. So if you're if you're looking for those schools, you might want to move out into a little deeper water and take a look out there. Um, the main place to look is at the mouth of a cove where it enters into the main part of the lake. Just start in the cove and start driving towards the, the middle of the channel, and most likely when you get from the 40 to 60 range, you'll start seeing some, some bass in those areas. However, 
as the day warms up and it starts to get a little bit warm in the backs of those coves, guys are fishing from 20 feet down to 10 feet. So as soon as there's a little bit of warmth on, on those uh, on those coves, especially with the water being so flat, uh, it's a good time to go check that out, uh, even though in the winter time. Is there any top water action about 1135? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't heard any reports for uh, top water. <laughs> Hmm. But, uh, I know you, Don. As soon as it starts, you'll be the first one up there on the lake trying it out. <laughs> Good stuff. How about the crappie guys? Um, crappie guys, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we still can't get a good bike on. I get a sporadic report. I'll go talk to a Kurt Rambo or a Art Chamberlain when he gets out and does some fishing, and they'll say on one day they'll catch a few crappie, and then on the next day, They'll think maybe they've got a pattern going or maybe something there, and they'll go out. It'll be absolutely zero. So it's we're calling it still very slow fishing for crappie on Roosevelt. Most of the guys, most of the summer visitors that, that still came back this year, and a lot of them didn't come back because the crappie bite has been down for a couple of years, uh, they're now going down to uh, Apache to do some fishing. I have probably answered... Uh, five emails, and I have two telephone messages to return today of guys wanting to know where to fish for crappie on Apache. <laughs> so, uh, so, but it's considered good down there. And There's surprisingly, guys are not fishing around the marina. Most people go to the marina for crappie fishing on Apache. Uh, this is more out on, on the main channel where there's uh, some structure drops that were, were done a few years ago. Seems like the schools of crappie are hanging out there in 25 to 35 feet of water. So uh, that's about what I can tell you on crappie on Roosevelt. It just hasn't been a good this year. It's, it kind of is duplicating what we did last year, and hopefully some of the, the changes that Chief Cantrell was talking about earlier will have an impact on the crappie. Well, I'm sure it will, you know, with the habitat, uh, introduction of new habitat, uh, doing something to uh, eradicate some of the gizzard shad that's going to free up uh, all the eggs that they uh, suck up and uh, really affecting uh, the largemouth and uh, uh, the bluegills are almost non-existent. Uh, crappies are going the same way, but, you know, I think... Uh, you know, there's not one magic bullet, but we've got a whole box of bullets to uh, throw at uh, Roosevelt Lake. So uh, I have high hopes that uh, this time next year we're going to see some, uh, you know, significant, significant recovery. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, one of the other things, speaking of out-of-the-box thinking by Chief Cantrell, for the first time, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, Game and Fish is actually going to do a survey of specifically targeted at crappie on Roosevelt Lake. Typically, crappie are too deep for the regular uh, surveys that they do. So this year, uh, in, as a response to the low numbers in there, they're actually going to try to do one uh, to identify the crappie numbers there and see if we can start to collect some data on Roosevelt for crappie as well as largemouth bass. Well, I think uh, under Cantrell's watch, we're seeing a lot of new uh, in different uh, data collecting methods. Uh, I know we're dealing with the catfish guys trying to, uh, you know, get some uh, population data, size data on the uh, flatheads, uh, the channel catfish, moving into the crappie, and uh, and then I think more significantly is identifying the biomass of, of the guys that create the problem, being the gizzard shad, uh, which is, you know, should be well above 30 percent right now. The last time they checked, it was 27 uh, percent of the bio biomass in the catch, and. Uh, we know it's elevated be well beyond that, so it's uh, it's fixable. Yep, I, I agree. But we need water, so you know between uh, all the guys who we know, we need to get the uh, folks up at the Mazel Casino, John. They're coming. Do the rain dance. Yes, they need to. We need, we need water. <laughs> that's the only thing right there, Jim. That's going to uh, uh, defuse uh, the impending uh, golden alga uh, toxin blow up at this point. More water. More water. More water. Absolutely, Don. I agree with you 100% on that point. By the way, guys, I prefer snow because the snow melt is a slower melt, and the runoff is a lot less uh, traumatic, and it, it saturates everything up north, and by the time it gets to the lake, it's coming in at a slower basis rather than the higher one, and we need that desperately. The voice of moderation. And reason. Uh, good point, J.K. I agree. That is a good point. That is a good point. But we don't have snow. 
We're going to get it. This year? Oh, yeah. Guarantee. Write it down. Sign it. I will. Okay. Bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything on uh, Bigfoot sightings or wolf sightings? Um, haven't, haven't heard anything. Uh, haven't seen any trail camera pictures. Uh, just, uh, but if not, you'll be the first to know. But well, did, keep, keep an eye out. We have uh, apparently a couple of rogues uh, running around Jake's Corner. Uh, uh, yeah. a, a, actually, four of them. And, and one of them is a big black one that's been sighted uh, on two different occasions, uh, one by Trail Cam and uh, one by uh, Mitch Victovic and, and his partner. Yeah. Well. I'm just saying. <clears throat> and, and we, need, we need a picture. You know, it's like Bigfoot. There's, you know, well, you know, you give a picture, they don't believe you anyway, so. <laughs> right. It's been doctored, photoshopped, I know. But Jared is out there looking, by the way. I talked to him yesterday. He was thrilled He's because. looking for what? Wolves or Bigfoot? <clears throat> Bigfoot. <laughs> our, our game is fish at work. You gotta love it. That's on his off time. He was thrilled yesterday because the Pace and Natural Resources Committee got a lot of their projects funded, so he was in a really good mood. I talked to him. Uh, good. Yeah, we got a lot of good people working hard for uh, the community of the state on the wildlife. Hey, we're gonna kick you loose. Wish you a uh, blessed rest of the day and a solid week next week. James Guggenauer, Rim Country Custom Rods. Check them out. It's really terrific and quite scientific, and I'm happy. All right, we're back. Good information from uh, Chief Cantrell, James Guggenauer. Uh, J.K. had some uh, words of moderation and uh, reason and wisdom. Thank you for that. I've been doing regular. it too many it's years, watching job. the weather patterns in Arizona. Yeah, so so what are you thinking? What are we in for? in for? If we don't get at least two good snowstorms that dump at least a foot across the rim, we're in big trouble. Yeah, we are. We'll be hauling water early this year. Okay, when's it coming? I'm hoping to see it by February the 2nd, and then I want one at the end of February. Two of those early big March, yeah, busters to come yeah. through, and at that point, we're okay. But we, if we don't get them, you know, Katie barred the door because there's going to be a lot of dry water holes. We'll be pumping the well, water. That, that we're going to have Golden Alga getting excited. Okay, uh, I want to thank both of you guys for coming down. Uh, uh, truly uh, good to have you here, uh, an honor, as it were, and uh, thank you both for your service. And uh, the, I, I know that doesn't cover it, but what, what do we say to guys like you? Here's a check. Here's <laughs> a check. <laughs> All righty. The ultimate pragmatist. Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, you do a great job, Trevor. Checks in the mail. No, that's – no, it, it, I'll tell you, it uh, – when people stop, and, you know, I, I wear the uniform every day, so people stop me and, you know, say thanks. I've had guys buy me lunch, you know, where I'm in Panda or whatever. Buying, yeah. I get and held it, up, and you get people uh, buying it, Exactly. <laughs> Something wrong with my outfit. Sure but I, 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 let me just say this, that every thank you, it, it does mean a lot. You know, when people do say that, it, it means more than most people think. It's not just empty words. So, yeah, thank you for that, and I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, getting back to uh, Army Bass Hangers, is there? Uh, do they still have the? Uh, okay, you have the regular mil- military guys. Is the coalition non-military? Are they still doing that? No, the coalition's still military. Um, Andy's coalition member. Yep, and he's in the military. Well, didn't they have a private sector member in the beginning? Or am I confused? They have a. Two different levels, a pro staff level, right. which is what I am, I, but I'm actually the director out here, and coalition, which anybody in the military, as long as you're still serving or had an honorable okay. discharge, can be a coalition member. And that's our core group of guys. I All mean, right. that's those are the guys who get out there and get it done. How's Major Cody these days? Colonel Cody. Are you f- really? Yeah, Colonel yeah. Cody. I would have to change my phone. Lieutenant Colonel Cody, I think, <laughs> yeah. But he's the only guy wow. I know that can squeeze twenty-eight hours worth of work in a twenty-four hour day. He's a mover, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how he does Man. it. Man, how's his health? I know he was fighting a battle there for a little bit. He seems to be doing good. Seems to be doing. He's getting ready to retire in probably sixteen months from now. Wow. Says he's going to start making some rounds around the country, coming out here. So right. hopefully we can get some stuff happening. And you ever, if you ever have the opportunity to shake hands with him, it's like shaking hands with a vice. <laughs> he's a big guy. He is. He's I mean, a big he's guy. Just rock solid, man. Nice guy. Former baseball player. Really? 
Yeah, he played with the uh, Braves triple-A team. What, one was, of the it, what was his MOS uh, in his lower ranks? I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure. I don't know if he ever had any lower ranks. Yeah, I think he was commissioned from the beginning. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think oh, he, entered, those I think he came yeah, right, yeah. right yeah. into being a major. Yeah. No. I <laughs> don't <laughs> uh, no, think so. They, they, cast, they just cast nice. him. There you go. There, yeah. You're a major. Come some need up. That's just mean. All right. Well, what can we do to help you guys? You know what? Last I think chance. I think doing things like this, giving us the opportunity to build Luke Bass Days, that's a huge it's a huge opportunity for us to get out there. Um, Arizona is not a big military town. It's not a big military state. We have a few Air Force bases. Yeah, but we have a lot of uh, a lot of vets. Oh, there's a veterans. lot of veterans out here. That's absolutely true. Life. But if you you if you go back in the southeastern portion of the United States and you go to uh, Kentucky, for instance, there's oh, yeah. military base. You can't throw a rock without hitting Texas, one. So yeah, yeah Texas is the same thing. So um, that we can get we can get our names, our shirts, the rap boat. We get that out and let the public know, hey, this organization does exist, um, right. and what we do, and try to recruit some members and some help, so we can support these charities. And really, that's the only reason we exist. We right? are We're, strength in numbers. We are strength in numbers. That that we it's have kind a, of an army thing in it. Absolutely is right. There's no I and T. Learn that at the little bighorn. <laughs> Just saying. He still looked like Custer, yeah. damn you. <laughs> That's why I don't like going to the cathedral. You know, <laughs> we're going to be doing big things. We're, we're just now growing out of Texas. And this is our, we've completed one full year out here in the western area. We're assigned our own charity, Heroes on the Water. And we're going to be doing big things out here. We need to grow. We need opportunities. What do we need to do to get uh, heroes on the water at full blown instead of fledgling status? Well, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, with us working in them, we have we've joined forces with All Star Bass and John Sneed. We offer a great guy a heroes on the water option yeah. on each tournament, and that raise that's a fifty fifty option. Half the money goes straight to heroes on the water, half goes to whoever wins the option. Nice. Yeah, they've yeah. they've actually managed. Um, I think they've managed like eight thousand dollars in fundraising over the past year. They've managed to put together um, six or seven kayaks. So it's a very small organization right now. The ones that are successful, um, they're saying neighborhood of twenty twenty five thousand dollars to really be uh, completely up and operational, which is a trailer with multiple kayaks. PFDs, fishing equipment, everything you need for the vets. And then these guys can go out and it gives them a fund for food. It gives them a fund for uh, renting picnic spaces. How many if, PFDs do you need? Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer You'd to that have to question. Contact yeah, Phil. it fills the guy that would know the answer to that. Right now, I think he has enough PFDs for his kayaks. The, the, the big deal is, is the boats are six, seven hundred bucks a piece. Yeah. The equipment to go with that, anybody that fishes knows is probably the most expensive sport there is, even on top of, high, of hunting. Uh, and the farther you get into it, the more expensive it becomes. Yeah. And um, so money is always an issue. It's always an issue, and it is for everybody. But um, as with any charitable organization, they're relying completely and totally upon uh, the generosity of others. So. Uh, look into it. Have your listeners look into it. Put it out there. Just get their name out there as much as possible. On your PFDs, let me let me stay on that topic for a second. Are they are these inflatable or uh, they're not inflatable? No, they're not inflatable because inflatables you. Falling out of a kayak doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you want the thing to go off, right? You want to be able to get back in. You want to get back in and keep fishing because you will. You know, a lot of guys will fall out, so they either have to be a manual inflate, which requires training. Or they're going to be just the standard uh, type class three PFD. Don, you haven't spent much kayak time, have you? I, yeah, I've seen a kayak. The 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 time I did spend on it, you were uh, rolling. Yeah, I yeah. just called it a roll over. Yeah. Hit the wall, it was, hit the fence. Whatever. He was, it was. was crossing the Bering Strait with well, Nana the north. We're going to get this thing wrapped up. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming down. You guys have an open door here anytime you want it. Uh, Appreciate that. Thanks, Don. We will do whatever we can to propagate uh, Army Angels, uh, all the branches, as well as heroes on the way. JK, thanks for your input today. As always. We'll pick on Starbucks next week. Yes, we will. Nice. <laughs> I'm Don McDowell. John Colazar. Tom Inman. Andy Gettle. 
Take your kids fishing, hug your bass boat. Salute a soldier. Got a price tag. We're out of here.